How are y'all doing? Good. Well, we're in the last week of our four-week sermon series called Gifts for the New Year. And if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you've heard me say this already, but I really felt led by God to preach this sermon series at the beginning of 2022 because, man, the last couple of years have been tough. And it doesn't look like 2022 is getting much better. And so I wanted to talk about some of these gifts that we have that should impact us and make our lives better, not just around Christmas time, but also through the rest of the year. And over the last few weeks, we've already talked about the gifts of love and the gifts of joy and the gift of peace. And today we're wrapping up by talking about hope. And I saved hope for last because I believe that hope is really the key to accessing those other gifts. In other words, the more hope we have in Jesus, the more we experience peace and joy, and the more we feel God's love about us. Well, someone gave me this really cool kitchen knife for Christmas. It was uh, this knife that I saw on social media. A guy named Kevin Massey, who comes to first service, had posted it on social media. And so I saw it, and I looked at it online, and I fell in love with it because it chops, it slices, it does all these different things, and it holds an edge really well. Here's, Here's a picture of me and that knife. Now, I I thought about using this as an illustration of this is what happens when you don't follow Jesus, but that's not what I'm using it for. Um, When when I got the knife, my wife put it up in a cabinet, and I kind of forgot about it for a few weeks. And then uh, a couple weeks ago, we had some leftover brisket, and I thought, you know what, barbecue sauce. And so I started looking for my knife, and I couldn't find it. And my wife wasn't there, so I couldn't ask her. So I just got really sad, and I just ate separate sliced barbecue and a baked potato with just butter uh, and cheese. Now, you're wondering why I couldn't use another knife. I could have. I was just sad about it. (laughs) But the reality is that name way uh, about the gifts that Jesus brought us. We have them, but are we putting them to use in our lives? To use a Christ analogy, I love. And the reality is this, our hope has been assaulted over the last couple of years, just over and over. Some of you guys have experienced one little loss after another, but but some of you have experienced huge, gut-wrenching, life-changing loss, and so much has been taken away from us over the last two years, so hope is something we really need in our lives. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 25, and we're going to keep coming back to that passage of Scripture. So if you want to just... Four brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the author of Hebrews, he starts out this passage by talking to us about this gift we have to be in the presence of God, and he's comparing it to the Old Testament temple uh, in, in the Jewish temple, and how the high priest had to approach this presence of God. And it tells us what Jesus did for us to make this possible, that when Jesus died on the cross, he was a permanent atonement or a payment for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God when we follow Jesus. So in the Old Testament, nobody was allowed in the most holy places in the temple except the Jewish high priest. It was called the Holy of Holies, and that's where God's presence resided. The Ark of the Covenant was there. And once a year on Yom Kippur, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, and he would go in to make a blood atonement for the sins of himself and the sins of the people. Now, this Holy of Holies, was, it was a small windowless room, and it was separated from the rest of the innermost temple by this huge heavy curtain. And, and so on Yom Kippur, the, the high priest would go in, but he had to be careful because it was a big danger going in front of a holy God and being a sinful man, and so he had to make a lot of preparations. He would be ceremonially cleansed. He would wear special garments. He would veil his eyes so that he couldn't see the presence of God, and then he would go. See, God used this as a reminder to the Jewish people over and over that sin brings death, and that God is a holy God, and that you can't come into him, his presence, without sin or with sin that hasn't been properly atoned for. There's actually this Jewish tradition, it's not in the Bible, but the Jewish history says that before the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, the other priest would tie bells around his waist, and they'd tie a rope to his ankle. So when the high priest would go in, as long as they heard the happy jingling of bells, everything was okay. But if they heard one loud jingle of bells, and then it got quiet, 
They knew the high priest had died in the presence of God. And so then they would take that rope and they would pull him out by his ankle because they couldn't go in through that curtain as well because they would die as well. But when Jesus died on the cross, all of that changed. He became the permanent sacrifice for our sins. His sacrifice fulfilled God's requirement for a full and perfect atonement, which results in our reconciliation of our relationship with God when we follow Jesus. The moment that Jesus died, that curtain between the rest of the temple and the Holy of Holies was torn. And so now, where the high priest was the only one who could go into the presence of God, and he had to do with that with fear, today we can boldly approach the presence of God. But the question is, how do we respond to this new freedom to be in God's presence? Look back at verse 22 through 25. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess on toward love and good deeds, not getting up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We need to gather together. We, we, we need to not get out of the habit of showing up to encourage one another, to challenge one another, to love one another. But then he talks to, to us individually and he says, unswervingly put your hope in Jesus. Now, I love this passage of scripture because it talks about two related concepts that are a little different, but they go together. So let's look at those. It's faith and hope. So first of all, let's talk about what the difference is between faith and hope. Faith this is a simple definition, is the complete trust and confidence in something or someone. It's faith. Faith is confidence about the past, and faith about the past leads to excitement and expectation about the future. If I were to tell my kids that we're going on vacation to Disney World at spring break, I ain't doing that. But if I did, they would believe that we were going to spring break on uh, spring break. I mean, they go to believe we're going to Disney World on spring break. And so they would have faith in what I said. But that faith would then lead to hope. They'd be excited and expectant about this exciting uh, vacation to spring break at their favorite vacation destination. That's the interplay between faith and hope. We have hope for the future in this life despite our present circumstances because we have faith that Jesus is worthy. We also have hope about the day coming, as the Hebrews writer said, when Jesus returns and all things are made right. But here's where so many of us mess up this gift of hope. We swerve. We do exactly what the Hebrews author tells us not to do. We don't stay with our eyes focused on Jesus. Put our faith in hope in something else. Our hope... The sermon left. We're going to unpack this a little bit. I really don't have 50 minutes left, but we are going to unpack it. We put our hope, anything that we put in Jesus' place as the most important things in our lives. And so if we put our hope in something other than Jesus, we've made that thing an idol. But Tim Keller says that all of our sin struggles that we think about, different things that we do that are sin, like greed, and those sins are just a symptom of a deeper problem that needs to be addressed in our life. Keller says that deeper than these surface idols are full path. Here are the source idols. Comfort, control. Now, let's look at the first one. The first one is comfort. Man, that's a big one for us. We live in the suburbs the suburbs were created to make us comfortable, right? We get all the benefit of the big city. We can drive in and have a big city job with a big city paycheck, but we don't have to live there. We don't have to deal with the problems of the big city. We get to drive out to the suburbs where we don't have those problems, but we still have lots of nice restaurants. We have good schools, all those things. But if we want the advantage of the city, we just drive in, have some dinner in the city. This is how bad this comfort idol has become. Curbside delivery. Chick-fil-A makes it where you can just put in your order on your app. We have it. I do it. The first hour, Matt in the back was showing me that he had the app, and I thought he was trying to tell me something was wrong in the service. So I, like, stopped, and he's like, no, 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 I'm just showing you my, my Chick-fil-A app. We have it, too, so that you can just put in what you want. It automatically charges your credit card. And, look, I, I get how difficult drive through is. I mean, you have to order out loud. you got to say it, and it wears you out. And then if that's not bad enough, you got to put your car back into drive, and you got to drive up about 10 feet. And then you got to open your window, not once, but twice. Once to pay your credit with, with your credit card, the other time to get your food. And so that's too difficult for us. So we've made it easy with that until it becomes where we put our hope. 
If we spend our life trying to create and maintain comfort cards, we don't want to wait, we want it, and we want it right now. Here's where this gets us into trouble. The idol of comfort fails us comfortable. And the reality is this, we haven't been as comfortable over the last couple of years. You guys know what I'm talking about. There were a point here in the Katy area, in the Houston area, where all the restaurants were closed. We couldn't go out to eat the way we are used to. Ladies, you couldn't get your nails done and your hair done. And if we're honest with one another, some of you were starting to look like you'd been camping out in the woods for a couple of weeks. <laughs> but so many different things that we took for granted as far as comfort were taken away from us. And be thankful that you live in Texas where we ain't scared of no little virus because there are places in other parts in the Northeast and in the West where they still have significant impacts on their life uh, where they can't do things and they're wearing masks outside. Travel has become way less convenient. If you've flown anywhere in the last two years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to wear a mask from the time you walk into the airport on one end until you walk out of the airport on the other end, unless you're actively eating or drinking. Now, I'm going to be honest about this. Sometimes I'm actively drinking on an airplane for a long time. I'll take the bottle of water and I'll just kind of put it up to my lips and wet my lips on occasion because you can't drink too much of that water bottle because then you're going to be uncomfortable having to climb over everybody to go to the bathroom. So you just kind of turn it up and let it wet your lips about every 30 seconds so you can keep your mask off for a while. Has anyone else done that or is it my... Yeah, all right. I wanted to be sure I wasn't the only one. If you've had a loved one in the nursing home or the hospital over the last two years, you know how uncomfortable it is. I have friends that lost their mom and their dad in a nursing home. They couldn't even go say goodbye. They knew they were deteriorating, but they weren't allowed in, so they couldn't even go say goodbye to their parents. It's gotten a little better, but it's still difficult. You can't just go visit people in the hospital. If you've been to the emergency room, you know how much less comfortable it is. I hear stories of people wait, waiting seven and eight hours at emergency rooms just waiting for someone. We're frustrated because we can't have what we want and have it right now. Look, and, and this isn't the only problem that this idol of comfort causes. This idol of comfort also causes us to live safe and secure lives. We, we, we want to live a safe and secure life, and so we don't take any risk. We don't take any chances. A number of years ago, we went as a family on a mission trip to Uganda, Africa, and when we got back, we told our story to people. And, and I found it interesting that some people would say, man, y'all are really brave. We even had a couple of people say, you know, I don't know that it was all that smart for you to take your young kids to that part of the world. And, and, and I thought about that, and that's just wrong. We had one of the best trips we've ever had. The faith of some of my kids was dramatically impacted by that trip to Uganda. They realized for the first time that what I'd been telling them for years was true, that Katie is not the rest of the world. And there are people that live very different lives than what we live here in Katy. If we'd allowed comfort to keep us from going, we'd have missed out on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Let's be honest. It wasn't a comfortable trip. We had to learn to use pit latrines for the bathroom. If you don't know what a pit latrine is, it's a hole in the ground. That's what it is. We, we couldn't wash our faces with the water. When we took a shower or whatever, we had to keep it away from our face because there was bacteria in the water that could make us sick. It wasn't comfortable, but it was awesome. Our quest for comfort and convenience keeps us from taking chances in our lives, and it keeps us from living a life of purpose and joy. So let me ask you, is comfort one of your idols? Does comfort sometimes keep you from taking a chance to live out your faith the way you should? If you put your hope in this idol of comfort, you're going to lose your peace even when you're comfortable <laughs> because you're going to worry about that that uh, comfort being taken away. And then when this life pulls back the curtain and you're no longer comfortable, then you're going to lose your joy. Here's the second source idol, control. You struggle with this idol of control if an important thing to you is trying to control the world around you. Now, I'm going to be honest, this is one I struggle with. I am much more comfortable with traffic when I'm driving than when I'm sitting in the passenger seat. Anybody else in that situation? My wife is big time that way. So if, we're, if I'm driving on I-10 and traffic stops like a football field ahead of us, safety in tongues <laughs> as we're braking. And then she'll reach up and grab the emergency handle or the, the, and, and then she'll put her feet literally up onto the dashboard. Like somehow that's going to slow down the impact of a frontal crash. It's funny but I do the same thing sometimes, except that I'm not nearly flexible enough to put my feet up on the dashboard. 
But here's how this idol works in less funny situations. We can convince ourselves that we can control everything around us. We, we, we want to create certainty in our future. And we do that. We buy all kind of insurance to protect us from all these different things. And we have retirement accounts and we have investment portfolios. And those things are all fine and good until that's where we put our hope. If we think we can control, control the future, that's when it becomes an idol. We also try to control the people around us. I spent years trying to control my wife. I spent years trying to convince her that if she'd just do what I said the way I wanted it done, we'd be happy. That didn't work out for me very well, right? I'm shocking. But some of you may be trying to do that right now. How's that working out for you? Not so well. We can't, the more we try to do that, where we try to fit people into our standards and our, our ideas of perfection, him, he's been there for two years. His college experience is not what he thought it was going to be, what any of us thought it was going to be. Three out of his first four semesters, he watched college online. He, and then he had to write a report. He hated it. No one thought, I did not think that a pandemic could change our future. But we know it has. We don't control that. Ultimately, we don't control the decisions our children make or how the people around us act. We, can, we are far weaker than we believe we are. The younger you are, the less you may believe I'm, me when I say that. The older you are, the more you know that's the truth. We are far weaker than we believe we are. But the reality is this. There's not one of us that can't have our happiness shattered by a phone call in the middle of the night about a loved one. There's not any one of us that can't have our foundation shaken when we go to the doctor and we get a diagnosis with some terrible disease. We don't control the future. And so if we put our hope in this idol of control, we're going to lose our peace and our joy. Here's the crazy thing about this idol of control. Even when the curtain and shows us that we really don't have control, then we lose our joy because that's where we found our hope. Where you put your hope makes all the difference in how you find these other gifts. Maybe your source idol is approval, and you just put your hope in the approval of other people. You, you just want to be liked. And so you worry a lot about what your friends think and what your coworkers think and what your family thinks. And you struggle with that. You, you worry about how people respond to you. And this is a very dangerous idol because you put your feeling of love into this hope, this hope for the approval of others. So you feel love based on how you're approved. Sometimes you don't feel worthy of love because you're not getting the approval that you wanted. Putting your hope in the approval of others is constantly going to let you down. It's going to rob you of your peace because you're constantly worried about if you said the right thing, if you've done the right thing, what people are thinking about the way you said it. You'll be worried about what people think about you. You'll feel self-conscious. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you put your hope in this idol of approval. You spend a whole lot of time trying to earn the love of the people around you. You're seeking the approval of man often at the expense of seeking the approval of God. And this is a sneaky idol, let's be honest. I don't really struggle with this idol much. This is not one I struggle with, but it snuck up on me in the past. I used to not have any social media, no Facebook, no Instagram, and I'd just check on my wife's Facebook to see how our friends were doing, and my high school and college buddies were all trying to get me to start a Facebook so we could communicate. So I opened a Facebook account, but I never posted because I didn't think people cared about what I had for dinner last night. And they don't. And so that's what I did until I became a pastor. And then once I became a pastor, I realized it's a great way to communicate with a lot of people. It's a great way to make connections. And so I started posting things on Facebook and Instagram. And I started to get lots of friends and followers and different things. And then I started to look to see who liked what I said or who commented positively on some post. Or if there was a post about if, if there weren't a lot of likes and comments... I'd start to wonder if maybe I didn't preach a good sermon. And I realized this idol, can I be really direct with you? If you are disappointed and let down when you look at one of your posts on Facebook or Instagram by the number of likes or the number of comments, you need to get off social media until you can kick this idol of, of approval in, in the behind. And let me respond to friend requests. You make friends by communication and shared experiences. I've read about how difficult this particular idol is for like former actors 
people that were a big deal at one point in time but no longer are because they got used to having tons of Instagram followers and having people care what they had for dinner last night. And then after they get out of the movie business, after a few years, people care a lot less and they really start to struggle that they're not getting the approval that they thought they would. The approval of others is fickle. It will let you down at some point. If this is where your hope is, you're going to struggle to feel approval even when you're getting it because it's never going to be enough. You're going to find some reason that you should have more approval. And this idol will ultimately fail you. And if that's where your hope is found, then you're going to lose your peace and your joy and the feeling of love. And instead of having those gifts, you're going to be chasing fleeting moments of happiness based on what somebody said about you on Facebook. And if you want to be in any kind of leadership in this country right now, if you need the approval of others, you're in the wrong place to be because you're not going to get it. And that's true whether you run a business, a nonprofit, a church, even just running your family. People are mean and opinionated right now, and they will not be happy with what you do. I just think about this mask issue for churches. You could not win the mask issue. If you required masks in church, then some people thought that you were a liberal church and you didn't have faith in God. If you didn't require masks, people didn't, thought you didn't have the love of Jesus for others. No matter what you did, about half the people were going to be disappointed. This criticism of any leader in our country, any organization, and it's harsh right now. So if you need the approval of others, you're going to struggle to have joy and to have peace. You're going to wither under the criticism, and you're going to make a decision that you think pleases people, and you're going to be shocked that half the people don't like what you did and you're going to watch your joy go out the window. Here's this last source idol where we sometimes put our hope, power. Now, before you discount this this one and say, I'm not really bothered by that power, let me tell you what it is. You put your hope in success. You just want to win. You want to win at work. You want to win in your family. You want to win at the game after dinner. And so the problem with that, if that's where your hope is, when you fail, when when you don't have success, you're going to lose your peace and your joy. But it doesn't even take failure to rob you of your peace because if you're winning, you're worried about not winning anymore. You're worried about not having success, and so it steals your peace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or is it just me? Because this is one I struggle with. I I like to joke that I don't love to win, but I sure hate to lose. And it's a joke, but but it's really not. See, I can actually be miserable when I'm having success because I'm worried about not having success, for that being taken away, and so I miss out on my peace. I tend to get less excitement out of winning than I do frustration when I lose. When things are going well, I worry that things that something's going to change. And this, but if that's where your hope is, it's going to let you down. So how many of you have ever failed at something big, whether that's a marriage, a business, a big project, or an adventure? And I have. Failure is a part of life. If you're going to live a life of adventure and you're going to get out of your comfort zone, you're putting yourself at risk for failure. And if you haven't failed yet, you will. But that shouldn't steal our peace and our joy. Actually, our Christian faith gives us some space to acknowledge we're not strong. We're not always going to win. I like to say I'm weak, but I worship a God who's powerful enough for both of us. We're not defined by our success or our failure. We are defined by our faithfulness to God. Look back at verse 23 one more time. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, don't go left or right. Don't get your focus off Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your hope in Jesus because he is faithful. He is worthy of our hope, and he will not let us down. In him you will find peace. In him, you will find joy. In him, you will feel love. This is true when things are going great, but it's also true when the world around you is falling apart. If your hope is in him, he'll come through, even in your darkest moments. He is worthy. Here's what I'm discovering about putting our hope in Jesus. The extent to which we experience God's grace is in direct proportion to the extent to which we recognize our own need for that grace and power. Let me say that again because that's a big deal. The extent to which we experience God's power and grace is in direct proportion to the extent to which we understand our need for that power and grace. 
Where are we putting our hope? Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, and he's talking about God here, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect. And it is. Doesn't it make sense that we, sense that we put our full hope in Jesus when, when we don't know what to do, or when we don't know where to turn, or where to go, and when we feel inadequate, or when we feel afraid? If those are the moments when Jesus is at his, his most powerful, shouldn't we step into those moments rather than run away from them? Shouldn't we take risks that get us out of our comfort zone? Therefore, we can acknowledge that he is enough for us, whatever comes against us. So I want to leave you with a picture of what it looks like to put your full hope in Jesus. So I want you to do me a favor. Bow your heads and close your eyes. It's not going to be weird. Well, it's going to be a little weird, but still do it anyway. Now, I want you to picture in your mind the illustration that I'm going to describe. Imagine that you're holding a drinking cup like you'd have for a meal. And imagine that this drinking cup is empty. And this empty cup rep represents your point of weakness in your life. It's your need in that moment for the strength of God's power and grace. Now imagine that you go over and you pick up a huge water hose. You don't know where the hose is connected because it runs off into the distance further than you can see. As you put the hose over the cup, the water starts flowing out of the hose. And this water represents God's power and grace. The water begins to slowly fill your cup. And you're not sure if there's going to be enough water to fill your cup. But there is. And just when the water gets to the very top, the water turns off. Now picture yourself coming back a little later. But this time you're carrying an empty bucket. Maybe you've had a bit of a health scare and life seems a little less certain. Or maybe things aren't going well at work and you're not getting along with your boss. Or maybe your marriage isn't going well. You need some grace and power and you've got a pretty big bucket. It's a lot bigger than the cup you had before. And so you're not sure that there's enough water to fill your bucket. But as you put the hose over the bucket... The water begins to flow. It slowly fills up the bucket, and just like with the cup, when it gets to the top of the bucket, it turns off, leaving your bucket full. Now imagine that you come back later, pushing a wheelbarrow. You've lost your job, and you're struggling to pay your bills. Or your child's gotten in trouble again, or your anxiety and stress about life seem to be getting the better of you. You need some grace and power, and so you put the hose over the wheelbarrow, and the water starts to flow. You're pretty sure there won't be enough water to fill this container. But there is. There's just enough. As it reaches the top, the water turns off. One last one. You come back again. This time you're driving an 18-wheeler truck pulling a massive water storage tank that's completely empty. And you know this time there won't be enough. You found out that the cancer's terminal or your marriage is over or the company's collapsed and it's going to take more than everything you've saved or you've just found out about the abuse. Your need is desperate, and you know there's not enough grace to see you through this time. But you'll take whatever you can get, so you put the hose over the big storage tank, and water begins to flow. The water doesn't fill the tank immediately, but you're amazed as the water keeps flowing and flowing, and the tank or truck begins to slowly fill up. Then eventually, when this huge tank is completely full, just to the top, the water turns off. Well, now you're curious about where all that water is coming from, and so you start to follow the hose to find the source. You walk quite a ways, seems like miles, and at last you find the source. There it is, a vast ocean of water that goes out further than your eyes can see. Whatever size container you come to God, our hope in Jesus, because he is always enough, he is worthy of our hope. So my encouragement to you is this, back your truck up. Put your hope in Jesus, because when you are weak, he is strong. 